shalom to you. I am shaloha, as my wife says. Before I speak this, must, this message this morning, I was just uh, thinking Pastor Tim, well, he's my friend. So, <laughs> Pastor Tim in the church, brother Tim outside the building, you know. I was thinking that, you know, over there I see many books. David Hawkins, uh, Brother Strat, and, and great writers, you know, great teachers. You got great books to read about the end times. You got great speakers. I got this teacher on the uh, men's conference. You have Israel End Times Conference on, on the year on the sea, on the Oahu. Uh, you got top of the cream speakers coming to this church. Uh, you got great teaching. But deep in my heart, still, there's a big need of the gospel in the world. And God has no plan B for you. There's no plan B for you. God has, has only God plan A. God has only plan A for you through our Lord Jesus Christ. So through Jesus, you are God plan A. You are the one he calls you to worship him. You're the one who calls you to share the gospel to the world. Uh, you're the one he calls you to worship his son this morning. And through Jesus, to, we're here this morning to worship our father. And to speak to you the way we want to speak to you, I'm just very grateful to the team and the team and the, team and the deacons and the members for the chance and the opportunity to given us to go this morning to give an update of the ministry we're doing in Israel around the world. So as a friend, thank you very much for giving us the opportunity at least once a year to preach the word of God, give an update of what we do around the world, and a message on evangelism, because that's the area God called us to be. You know, and it's a little teaching today too, because we begin Passion Week tomorrow. But I want to say thank you for the opportunity. You pray for us also, and pray for the ministry the finances through World Mission Outreach. And that uh, you remember a long time ago, as Pastor Tim said, long time ago, not too long, of course, you know. I mean, we're still young. We were, I was single, and there were a bunch of guys single in this church. <laughs> and I remember there was a man here in this church, and, and this young man and I, we met, and we worshiped the Lord, we shared the gospel, and we did this together. And uh, we pray for the right spouse. And the name of this man is Brother Strat, Strat, uh, Good. <laughs> Do you know that man by any chance? <laughs> ah, here he is. There you are. And uh, this man out there and I, we were single and seeking the Lord's will. And this, I saw the book. I want to buy it. Whatever. <laughs> Sign it, please. We were praying to God for God's will to be known alive on our knees. Lord, pray for this, pray for that. And we pray for even to God to have mercy on us for the right spouse. And years later, God in mercy and grace gave a spouse to each other. And, I see his wife now next to you. The Lord bless you. First time I get to meet you today. Can't wait to say, hey, shake your hands after that. You know? <laughs> and uh, so the Lord bless you. Try. Thank you for your faith in Jesus. And this church pray for us and support us for many years. And then we can marry. We are from Maui, Hawaii, based in Jerusalem now, bringing the gospel of Jesus to the world. And anyhow, we're in Hawaii now for three weeks doing Pastor Mercedes, going back to Israel in May, April 1, going back to Jerusalem via the mainland because we have a team in May coming to Israel to share the gospel of Jesus to Jews and Muslims. So next year, if you are open to join us next May, join us. Many of you go to Israel in tour groups. Go. There are so many teams going to Israel doing tour groups. And I've seen them. I live in Jerusalem. Like the first time I said, I do it again. We live downtown Jerusalem. We see buses from around the world with a flag. And the Australians, the Aries, the Brazilian, the American, the Chinese, Japanese also over there. The Russian, the Romanian, the Spanish, all amigos, El Sombrero. I see the uh, Mexican guys too, you know? All these Mexicans with Sombrero too. And the bus is coming to Israel, all the flag of the world. All tourists, from 6 a.m., they get up. 7 a.m., they run on to 6 p.m. From 7 to 7, they run to 25 locations in one day. They get to the hotel, tired, exhausted, thinking, what do you see today? And they forget, which is good. Go with them, but we don't do that. We bring teams every year for two weeks. Three days, evangelism to Jewish people. One to one by the Sea of Galilee. You are camping right with them in the midst of 25,000 Israelis going to a new age festival, Shiva. Mantra music from India. Now how the Indian ladies and Indian people, no? <laughs> We were just in Nepal, preaching the gospel of Jesus. We prepared a Jewish campaign in Nepal, as we speak. The first Nepal Jewish campaign being prepared with God's help in Kathmandu. So all these Israelis bring, bring back to Israel all the witchcraft stuff in New Age things. 
So we bring team to share the gospel to the Israelis and all the Jews, when they see our team from all over the world, they go, they get puzzled. Why, you're from all over the earth. Why are you, are you together? And we say, Jesus the Messiah. We're here to tell you the Son of God. And then to the Muslims, to tell them the hope of Jesus. I know you get all this end times teaching, but we want you to put in practice in the Middle East and around the world this gift, the simple message of God the Son who became flesh, died on the cross and rose from the dead. So we want to encourage you to really think about it, pray about it, to join us one day in the future and outside the door you can sign up. So let me pray now for this message. Thank you, Father, in the name of Jesus, for this day. We ask you, Lord, to bless the audience. Thank you for the guests from Japan that encouraged me to slow down my speech. Help me, oh God, to convey this teaching from the bottom of my heart, where you put in my heart, Lord, to share the word of God on the Passion Week, that Jesus, who is God the Son, be lifted up, and that you, God, be glorified. You speak to each heart in the way that you, God, Holy Spirit, want to speak in each heart through the word of God. Welcome to this place, God, Holy Spirit. Take over my lips, open the ears to hear the word of God, and remove any spirit of the warfare away from our presence. In the name of Jesus, thank you, Father, for this day. Amen. Long time ago, <clears throat> it was beyond 2,000 years ago. Let's go back to 2,500 years ago. There was a young man, like any one of you could have been, in Babylon. In those days, Babylon was a great kingdom. It was one of the empires of the world. We know that. And that um, this young man was called Zechariah. And he was a young man, he was a priest, born in Babylon. He was in exile, a son of a Jewish family. As a young man, he returned to Jerusalem from Babylon. And then God gave him prophecies. And God spoke to this young man, and of course, he became old after a while. And he said in Zechariah chapter 9, he prophesied about the future. In Zechariah chapter 9, 9, he says, Rejoice, O daughter of Zion. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout of that of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Command. Your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation. Lowly and riding on a donkey. A colt, the foal of a donkey. And so this young man spoke about the end times. And the amazing situation is that exactly many, 2,500 years ago he spoke these prophecies. And exactly 500 years after he spoke this, Matthew, one of the disciples of Jesus, came in the picture. And he remembers Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. And Matthew now was beholding the Son of God right here in the flesh in Jerusalem. And this Jesus called out Matthew, follow me. And this Matthew gave up all the treasure of the world. He was Levi. And then Matthew 21 says about Zechariah. Matthew takes Zechariah chapter 9, 9. And he quoted in Matthew 21, verse 4, Matthew quoted, and he says, Matthew 21, 4 says, All this was done, that it, was, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, <clears throat> Behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey. I called the fall of a donkey. And there is Matthew now, this wonderful man, who quoted from the Old Testament, is speaking to us in this 21st century of these great prophecies that sometimes overlook. Here we are again today, 2013, and tomorrow night being the first night of Passover, here, there is now upon us again, here is upon us a new, another feast, another feast upon us, fast and approaching, which is tomorrow night, the Passover night, the first night of Passover. Coming in for believers next weekend on Easter, which is Resurrection Day. So from Passover, which begins tomorrow night, to next Sunday, we have Easter, which is in Resurrection Day, in the Passion Week. Easter is called in the West World, in the Western by the Greek, but actually the word Easter is in Jewish context, means the first fruits. It's come from Leviticus chapter 23. Jesus is the first fruits from among the dead. It was God the Son, Jesus, who fulfilled this feast of the first fruits. He is risen from the dead. And one day, by God's grace, because you are born again, you will follow suit. When Christ comes back, second coming, you'll be raised from the dead. That's why it's called the feast of the first fruits. He's the one 
of the first fruits raised from the dead. And after this harvest, at the end of the world, at the end of the second coming, he raised from the dead to fulfill the prophecies in the complete sense. You find this in Acts chapter 1, 6 through 8. But we know, based on the chapter 21 here, here is Jesus coming to Jerusalem on a donkey. We know that after the triumphal entry of Jesus in Jerusalem, we have the Passion Week to remember him. That's why I give communion when he says to remember him. So, so her is Shali in Hebrew. So her means to remember, to remember me. So because we know Jesus and the Holy Spirit opens our heart, when we read the Bible, we can look back and we can understand the context, the whole setting, because we know the Lord. So looking back as a believer, <clears throat> we know the context of the scriptures because we take Zechariah and Matthew, we put this together. But in my heart, I was thinking about the audience this morning. I was thinking about you, about me. I was just wondering for a moment, the following. I was just wondering if we, all of us, had been there in, in the middle of this situation when the crowds uh, were saying, verse 8, and the very great multitude spread the clothes on the road. Others cut down the branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then the multitude who went before and those who followed cry out saying, Matthew 21, 21, 9, they were saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. So the crowd in Matthew 21, 4 through 6 and 9, they were calling this Messiah, Hosanna, Hosanna. And Hebrew means uh, Baruch Haba Hashem Adonai. Baruch Haba Hashem Adonai. So they were crying, they were calling on the Messiah. Welcome is him who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna is a political statement in this case. So I was thinking in my heart, if we have been there in the middle of the crowd in Jerusalem, what would have been your response? What would have been your reaction? or your action toward that claim at a particular moment. People today act or react to situation. Either we act to the situation or we react to the situation. Two choices people do all over the world all the time. So I want you to imagine being that day in the middle of the crowd, like Matthew 21, I read it again in verses six. So the disciples went and did what Jesus commanded. They brought the donkey and the colt, laid their clothes on them, and set him on them. And a very crowd, once again, the multitude were spreading the clothes on the road. All they cut down the branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then the multitude went before, and those who followed cry out, saying, Hosanna, the son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. So there was a crowd at the moment when Jesus came to Jerusalem. There was a crowd, and they saw Jesus coming to Jerusalem on a donkey. Imagine the king on a donkey. Today we got King Abdullah in Saudi Arabia. He comes to Mecca in Rolls Royces and in helicopters. The last week we got somebody from the West, a major president, came in to Israel in 747 with all the first class hotels. But this one prophesied coming to Jerusalem on a donkey. What a humble attitude. The eternal living one. Think of this. The eternal living one now on a donkey. So now there was a crowd to respond to this particular event of the Son of God fulfilling that day, the Passover day. To fulfill the Lamb of God as He came to Jerusalem, the Passover Lamb. Today, we had the same situation. Some people of the world are busy today. Thanks God for next week came. We had this wonderful uh, invitation. I pick it up with me because I want to announce it once again. Next weekend we get this wonderful opportunity to tell the world the real meaning of Easter, the real meaning of Passion Week. I want to encourage you to bring somebody next weekend. Because today the same thing as it was in Jesus' day. Today, people of the world are very busy. Many will wonder about this coming week. Oh yeah, what's that? Passover? What's that? Oh, the Passion Week? Oh, the resurrection of the Son of God? This event will come. This event will pass. And for many, it is like another religious event, like any other religion or religion of the world. One more event, like any other religion. We just preached the gospel in Nepal from February to March. On March uh, 10th was the day of Shiva. 
two million Hindus line up in Kathmandu to go through this temple in Kathmandu. They go to the gurus and after the temple they get a red mark on the head. For them that's a highlight for this world living in Nepal as it is for the Jews tomorrow. A highlight to do Passover. <coughs> so in whole, the whole world has their own system of religion. So for many people in the world they will see this event of Passover, the Passion Week, and the Messiah coming to Jerusalem just like another religious event. But deep in the Bible, we know the truth. The Bible says that triumphal entry, when Jesus came to Jerusalem, upon this triumphal entry to Jerusalem, known to us as the Palm Sunday, which is today, 2,000 years ago. From that triumphal entry to the Resurrection Day, it is called the Passion Week. And we know in our heart, by the grace of God, the Passion Week is known to us as the last week of Jesus on earth. Imagine, somebody tells you, next week is your last week on earth. What will you do in one week? You get straight in your heart in every way. So it was the most important week of his life that Jesus knew. He came to fulfill the Father's agenda. Jesus was very focused. He came to fulfill the Father's agenda. He was really focused on the Father. And this is very important. I want to begin on this topic this evening, this morning. I'm sorry. Jesus was so in love with the Father. He knew who the Father was. He knows who the Father is. He will ever know who the Father will be. He's the only one who knows the Father. And we know in our heart that only through Him we can worship the Father. We haven't seen the Father yet. John 1 18 says that. But only Jesus knows the Father. Only Him reveals the truth, who the Father is. Ahava in Hebrew means love. And that's what love means I'm in Hebrew. Behold the Father. That's what it means in the Hebrew context. So Jesus was really focused on the Father. There were so many trials going on in the week. Like we have trials in our life, in the easy time or the hardest time of your life. Stay focused. Because all the trials have one purpose, to keep you away from the real focus of the main thing, of the main thing, of the main thing. But Jesus gave us an example. And through him, the vine with the branches can also be focused in the Father. Because through him, he has access to the Father this morning. So we have a Father in heaven who has all authority. And the Bible says that the law of Moses, the prophets and the writings, prophesied why Jesus fulfilled during that Passion Week. In one week, Jesus fulfilled so many prophecies. <clears throat> and this is very important. Because, because Jesus became the Lamb of God as prophesied in Zechariah chapter 9. He entered Jerusalem on the donkey uh, as a king and the Lamb of God. And when Jesus entered, it was written of him, all of this, by the prophets, by the Lord of Moses, and by the writings of the prophets. And this is very important because today in Jerusalem, what shall I ask the Muslims? I asked them, well, tell me something. Before Muhammad was born, give me books written of him, prophecies. He was going to be born to be the prophet who is today. There's no books about Muhammad. When I go to the Far East, I tell the Buddhists, give me books about Buddhists that I spoke about him before he was born. There is nothing about those books, about those guys. There are no books about any prophet of the world except one book. The Lord Moses, the prophets, and the writings speak and they wrote and they spoke of God the Son, the Messiah. So we have a great evidence. We have internal evidence and external evidence in Israel today of that reality of God the Son, Jesus, who became the Lamb of God. Even Jesus in the Gospels, Matthew 24, Luke 24, he quoted. To remember, there were two disciples after the resurrection of Jesus. There were two disciples walking on the Emmaus Road, and they were walking. On the Emmaus road, Luke 24. And they were talking to each other. Oh my gosh, I can't believe it. The Messiah had to die, all this stuff. And Jesus came next to them. And Jesus began talking. So, hello, fellows, what's going on? And the Jew guy, the Jewish, they go, Don't you know what happened in Jerusalem? This guy, we thought he was the Messiah, but he died. And then the Bible is saying, Luke 24, 24, 25. And Jesus went back to Moses. And beginning with Moses and the prophets and the writings, he began to review his teaching about him. And then he got to the house. He broke bread in half, like in the upper room. And the eyes were open. And they said, it is the Lord. And Jesus disappeared. 
So we must stay focused with the law of Moses, the prophets and the writings to point to the Son of God, the Word of God point to Him. And for example, of these Old Testament prophecies, we have Isaiah 53, for example. Isaiah 53 describes how Messiah would die. Now, it's a long chapter. Today I had no time to read Isaiah 53, but you can read it at home. I hear people in Kalua love to do homework. And I say this morning, and they laugh, and you laugh too. Either it's true or it's not true. Homework. The kids are here. They go to school. Do you like to do homework? All right. He said yes. You know, homework is very important. So Isaiah 53 describes how Messiah will die. And before I go further, you know what? This chapter is very important in Jewish evangelization. In Israel, we bring teams every year. And that uh, Isaiah 53, 11 says, My righteous servant will justify the many. And when I show the gospel to Jews, even Muslims, but when I show the gospel to the Jewish people, you know, I ask them, so who is this one the prophet speaks about in Isaiah 53, 11? And they're reading with me in Hebrew or English. And he says that my righteous servant will justify the many. Isaiah 53, 11. And the Jewish person says, oh, that would have been Moses. I said, no, it could have been Moses. And they go, why not? Because Moses disobeyed the Lord. He beat the rock. And water came out, out of God's mercy, but Moses disobeyed the voice of God. Moses was supposed to speak to the rock, but he hit the rock. And because of that, he missed the promised land. He died outside the land. And the Jews go, yeah, it's true. And they say, oh, I know who it is. It's King David, Melech David. I said, if sure, no, no possible. They go, why not? Because he slept with Bathsheba committed adultery. They go, oh yeah, it's true, it's in the Psalm 51. I forgot the one. And then the Jewish person says, oh, I know who he is. And I go, who's that? And they say, King Solomon, Melech Solomon, Shlomo. And I say, no, it couldn't be. They say, why not? Because he had 800 wives. Sin against the Lord. And they all say, I know who it is. And the Jewish person says to me, and I say, who's that? They say, it's Israel with a nation. I say, no, impossible. He goes, why not? Because today Israel is the highest per capita abortion of the world. Maybe China has more people of the world, but per capita Israel has the highest of the world in abortion. Do you know today in Israel, the rabbis tell the young people, you can abort after six months, allowed to abort. Because before six months, there is no spirit in the baby yet. Where did that come from? So the nation, the people of God, although God loves Israel, don't confuse me, and conditional covenant, still each person is accountable for their own sin. And the people are in sin today. Sin is sin. And therefore, that's why the Messiah came, to be the Lamb of the world, the Lamb of God for the Jews first, also the Gentiles. So this Jesus came to the world. And so Daniel 9, 9, 24 says, in chapter 9, 24, Daniel describes when and the timing of his death will take place. So Isaiah described how he will die. Daniel chapter 9 describes when we will die. And Leviticus 23 predicts Messiah's ministry and Israel's future. It is right there written in the Torah, in the prophets, and the writings by the word of God. All of them describe a perfect Messiah who will die on the cross and raise again on the third day for the sins of the Jewish people and the sins of mankind. What a hope the world has. What a hope next week we have in this building for Kailua, Oahu, Hawaii. What a hope we have in every country of the world as long as we are focused just like Jesus was so focused. It is no easy. It is no easy, my friends, because Jesus also was tempted just like you and I are tempted today. So that triumphal entry into Jerusalem surely began the day Jesus entered Jerusalem and on that day, Jesus began his slow march to the hill, to the cross. And that's why in Matthew 21, 6, 9, we got this reading. I already read it. Matthew 21, 6, 9, how this context will happen when Jesus entered Jerusalem on a donkey. And why he came forth to Jerusalem and how the people responded and their expectation. Here is Jesus coming to Jerusalem to fulfill the Father's expectation. Here are the people wearing him to fulfill their expectation. Two different expectations. We will see very soon the conflicts of what happened right there. On the one hand, the Son of God was focused 
in the Father's agenda to fulfill the Passover feast. God gave himself seven feasts. God in heaven gave himself seven feasts through Israel, which is yet to be fulfilled by Jesus, the Son of God, in the Father's time. Acts 1 7, Jesus says that in my Father's authority, I go to fulfill all the seasons. Season number one, unleavened Passover. Number two, unleavened bread. Number three, first fruits. Number four, Pentecost. We are in the season right now. Number five, trumpet rapture. Number six, atonement or restoration of Israel. Number seven, tabernacle, messianic kingdom. All in order, just like Pastor Tim taught two days ago. The four cups is in order fulfilled by the Son of God. If you came here Friday, two days ago, you understood the four cups very well. In the same way, God wants His Son to fulfill each of those cups in the Father's time, so the Father wants His Son to fulfill the seven feasts in the Father's time. So Jesus was very focused. He came to fulfill the Father's agenda on the one hand, but on the other hand, the people throwing branches on the road, expecting Jesus now to begin the millennium, the famous 1,000 years. So friends, the triumphal entry was related to the observance of Passover, rule number one. It is being suggested this entry happened on the 10th of Nisan. In the Jewish calendar, the day this took place was on the 10th of Nisan. 2,000 years ago, it was a Jewish calendar. It's called the 10th of Nisan. Today, we got Gregorian calendar. It's a different calendar moved move by the sun. In these days, by the moon calendar. So on this day, on the 10th of Nisan, according to the Jewish law, according to the Old Testament, you written in Exodus, you can find it right there. You can find it right there. In Exodus 12, 36. According to Exodus chapter 12, 36, God commanded Israel to choose a Passover lamb, a little animal, a perfect animal, was chosen and set aside for the sacrifice to be done on the 14th of Nisan. So there was a process of four to five days to examine the lamb. During this time, the lamb, a little animal, was examined to be perfect in health and purity and blemish before it was killed on the 14th of Nisan by the nation. So imagine the process. Before God became flesh, it was animals every year chosen in Israel. Little animal, <laughs> chosen among many. And he was being a little animal, perfect male, examined everywhere. For five days he was being examined to make sure he made all the rules and regulations for the killing on the 14th of Nisan. So Jesus came on that time. On the 10th of Nisan, 2,000 years ago today, in the triumphal entry in Jerusalem, Jesus fulfilled the 10th of Nisan. On this day, 2,000 years ago, the Son of God, the Messiah, presented himself as the Lamb of God at the triumphal entry on a donkey. What a humble servant. During the remainder of the week, for four to five days before he hanging on the cross, because she's the 14th of Nisan, Jesus endured trials harsh trials. He was tested. He was questioned. Jesus was even struggling with his appointment before God, just before he died on the cross at the Garden of Gethsemane, when he said to the Father in Luke 22, 42, he said to the Father, Father, if it is possible, pass this cup away from me. The cup remains the cup of judgment he is about to drink is the cup of judgment we deserve for our sins. The cup he was praying for, if you were here two days ago, that cup is the kind number two of the first of Seder. There are four cups in the first of Seder, sanctification, judgment, redemption, cup of praise. The cup of judgment and the cup of redemption are individual cups. Cup number one is a collective cup. Cup number two will be a collective cup in the marriage supper of the Lamb, but cup number two and three is individual cup. Cup number two, the cup of judgment will accept the drink for our sins. My sin, my life, my sins, my judgment. Card number three is cup of redemption. It's his life. Jesus said in Luke 22, 20, he said, card number three, this card represents my covenant in my blood shed for you. So you can't know Jesus Christ. You know what you did? Exchange of cup. He threw the cup of judgment you deserve on the cross. That's what he meant by here when he said, Father, if it is possible, take this cup 
away from me means if there's any other way, I can redeem the human race. And he says, no, no, my will be done. But your fathers be done. It means, Father, for the Israel came to the world, and next morning he took your cup of judgment on the cross. And when you accept Christ in your heart, you accepted cup number three, the cup of redemption into your heart. That's what happened right there. So Jesus fulfilled this, the fourth thing on Easter. Jesus endured trials. He was tested. Even when he was tested by the Pharisees and the, uh, the Sadducees, religious leaders, it's called the Sanhedrin. They were trying to laws. The Sanhedrin broke that day on Jesus. They broke the laws already, the religious people. But they want to impose the laws on Jesus. And they broke all of them on that particular evening. Jesus endured all these trials. He was tested. He was tempted just like you are tempted today. Today, all of us sometimes are being tempted in every way, in thoughts, in words, or actions. We're being tempted. But there's no excuse for sin. Because the Bible says, he died, he rose from the grave, he's alive. And uh, Hebrews chapter 4 says that Jesus is the high priest who can come for mercy and grace to uphold us in time of needs. So we have a high priest right now who sympathizes with my needs, with your needs. Whatever trials you go through in your life, he was there before, and uh, even more. Whatever temptation or circumstance you go through in your life, in easy time or hard times, all of us go through, he was there before, and even worse, he was there into it. But he overcame everything on our behalf. So you can come to him with confidence. Thanks God, the high priest in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, <clears throat> before our Father. So Jesus then fulfilled on the 10th and Easter the entrance. Five days he was being examined. On the 14th day, he was crucified on the cross. And Jesus right there fulfilled that particular feast of the Passover. So at the end, friends, Jesus was proven pure, healthy, and appropriate for the sacrifice. That's what the Bible says in John 1, 29 says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. No one of us could have been um, successfully passed the test. No one of us could have been successfully passed this test. That's why I said again to Jesus with the last temptation. There were three temptations on the last one. In Messianic kingdom thinking, he says, Jesus, listen, to you was promised to rule Jerusalem, Israel. To you was promised to rule the world in Psalms chapter 2, verse 7 and 8. But I give it to you. If you just for a second, maybe half a second, bow down, worship me. Matthew 4. Just worship me, I give the kingdom, says Satan. Jesus didn't do that, thanks God. If Jesus would have done it, all of us would have been lost forever. That was the last one flaw Satan wants Jesus to fail. In that temptation, somewhere, Satan wants him to, to fail one point. So who don't meet all the points? He kept all the points on our behalf. All of us brought Ten Commandments. No one of you has kept Ten Commandments. Raise the hand, he who has kept all Ten Commandments. Be careful. Don't raise the hand because I will stone you to death. <laughs> and somebody help me probably. I brought one, I brought all of them. So at the end, Jesus was proven pure, healthy. And appropriate. That's why John 129 says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So Jesus, my friend, at the triumphal entry, according to Zechariah chapter 99, Jesus also did the official presentation as the King of Israel. The Bible says, Behold, your King is coming. So when Jesus came to Jerusalem on the triumphal entry, Jesus entered in, into Jerusalem as the King and as the Lamb of God at the same time. King and Lamb of God. What an amazing king, what an amazing lamb. Have you seen this famous picture of the lion and the lamb together? Somewhere in the world? You see a painting of the lion and the lamb? That's what comes to my spirit when I see this title right here. The lamb and the lion together. What together? Into Jerusalem, sitting on a donkey. What an amazing prophecy. What a king we have right there. So the king, Jesus, came to fulfill Passover. So he came on the donkey to fulfill the Passover lamb, the particular feast God promised to the people of Israel. But at the same time, when Jesus came on the donkey, the people saw him, and the people misunderstood. They misread. They misunderstood the timing of the coming. If you read the Bible 21, it says there, the multitude of the people, they broke branches, and they put it on the ground. My friend, 
Branches have a different symbol than Passover. It does the same thing. Branches are different symbols than Passover, different uh, messages. The use, of, the use of branches is a response. The use of branches is a response to Leviticus 23. It's a long chapter to get home. And Zechariah chapter uh, 14. The actions of these people in Jerusalem, the actions of the people in putting branches on the road, and they cry out, Bless is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Bless is the kingdom that comes. It shows that these people were expecting the kingdom to begin. They were expecting the Messianic kingdom to be set up that day and begin the millennium or tabernacle. That's they were thinking in their mind, the audiences, the majority of the people. That was the thinking of them in the particular moment. Why? Why these audiences, when Jesus came on the donkey, why the audiences of this group of people were thinking like this? Why? Because, because many of the Jewish people had witnessed the resurrection of Lazarus. They had witnessed it. And they felt that the kingdom had arrived. They, 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 they thought, oh my goodness, this is Messiah. He rose Lazarus from the dead. Resurrection time has come. We will not rise from the dead. Millennium now, it's in the kingdom, tabernacle is here. That's what happened in the particular moment with the mind of the, of the Jewish people. That is the feast of tabernacle when Messiah will rule Tanjung from Jerusalem in the world. That's in the future according to Acts 1, 6 to 7. That's the future. So before I go further, it is right here I want to kind of insert something else to you, food for thoughts. When Jesus went to uh, that Bethany to raise Lazarus from the dead, just before he went there, the Bible says in John 11, Jesus says to the disciples on the way to the town, Lazarus was already dead. Jesus says in John 11, 11, Jesus says, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to wake him up, I mean, to raise him from the dead. And then John 11, 14 says, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, Jesus says, and for your sake, he says, and for your sake, I am glad I was not there so that you may believe I am the Messiah. I am him. It was a proof to the nation that he is the one. But this event it took place exactly after Matthew 12. Because John 1, 11, 11, or John chapter 11 ties in with Matthew 12. Let me explain this carefully. Matthew 12 was the, the point of transition when Jesus was rejected the Messiah. Before Matthew 12, he did miracles to the nation, miracles to the nation as an authentication, I am the Messiah. But they, the, the religious people call him, no, no, you are casting out demons in the name of Beelzebub, Satan. And after that moment, Jesus made transition. No more miracles, no more sign, no more miracles. Now he went to a private healing, private salvation. Now salvation is individually. And then they decided that the religious people challenged Jesus. Jesus, give us a miracle, give us a sign. They ask for another sign. Jesus says, listen carefully. He says, Jesus says, no more signs for this nation, wicked generation. Jesus says, after Matthew 12, he says, no more sign. But I give you only one sign to believe who I am. I give you the sign of Jonah. That's the only sign Jesus gave, the sign of Jonah. And we all know the sign of Jonah has to do with the resurrection. And friends, where do you find the topic of the resurrection? Only in the gospel. That's the only sign that Jews we have today to be saved. The gospel of Jesus the Messiah. Because the resurrection is found only in the gospel. That's why we got the resurrection of Lazarus. And uh, they wouldn't believe in Jesus. They wouldn't believe in him. We got the resurrection of Jesus. They wouldn't believe in him. There's one more resurrection coming up in the future. The resurrection of two witnesses. And then one third will believe in him in the end times. That's the only sign God gave to the nation of Israel when it comes to the resurrection of himself. The, res the sign of Jonah. <coughs> So it's right here then Jesus then challenged the, the, the people to believe on him. That he is the one who can fulfill the, the Passover lamb. So why then they believe that? And the majority rejected and the majority believe it? Because it was based on our personal decision, personal salvation to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. So my friends, today happens to us. Let me give you an example. The same expectation happens to us today in different angles. This is the application. For example, 
as of today for us believers. We know the rapture is coming at any time. We know the rapture is the next feast for God to fulfill through his son for us, the body of Christ. We are saved by grace alone. And we know in our heart the rapture is at any time. Is the next feast to be fulfilled. We know that rapture is imminent. We know that. And so deep in your heart, you want him to come. And so you want him now. Some people say, Lord, come back now. I'm waiting for you. You want him now. Don't you? Because of trials and tribulations and all this mess of the world. And so we want him back. We want the rapture to happen today. But Jesus wants us to stay focused on the Feast of Pentecost. Because we are at the Feast of Pentecost right now. We are mindful of the next feast is coming back. But not at the expense of the commandment he gave us. He, he says, go preach the gospel. After the resurrection in Acts 1 8, he says, Acts 1 8, Jesus says, and the Holy Spirit shall come upon you to be witness of me in Jerusalem and Judea and around the world. So we are today on the feast number four, Pentecost. We are right there right now in that season. But sometimes we want to push the agenda. Lord, come back now. Like on Jesus' day, he came to fulfill the feast of Passover lamb, the lamb of God. But they want him to be now tabernacles. Same concept, expectations. Sometimes we have, and we impose the human will on God the Father's agenda. We can't do that. We are mindful of what's coming up in the future, but faithful in the Father's authority. The Father says, this is my son. Listen to him. Jesus said, Acts 1 8, the Holy Spirit will come upon you to be witness of me. So that's the command Jesus gave us, the commander in chief. So that's the priority we have today to bring the gospel to the world, Jew and Gentiles. Romans 1 16 says that. So the same thing happened in the day of Jesus to the people of Jerusalem. They wanted, Jesus came as the Lamb of God, but they wanted him now to begin the Messianic kingdom. And that's what happened in that particular moment. That's why there was a conflict of interest in the day of Jesus. So Jesus came to Jerusalem. And these Jewish people had the expectation of the Messianic kingdom, of the, of the Messiah to be the conqueror servant. And these two items prevented, blinded them, prevented them to see that Jesus came as the suffering servant, the Lamb of God, to take away the sins of the world. He came to be the Lamb of God according to Isaiah 53, verse 11. So they miss it. Many in the, the Jesus miss it. Only a few believe on him in that particular day. So, the same thing today, my friend. Many from the whole world will miss this coming week. They will miss this coming week. Oh, yeah, Passover is coming up. What's that? Passion week, what was that? Resurrection day, what was that? It's gone. Now on Christmas. <laughs> they rush into a system which is for me. Oh, this is for me. My gift, my things, you know. So, see, it's my world versus the Jesus, the Father's agenda. It's a two different world, friends. We got our Father in heaven who has an agenda. His agenda for you and for me is his son. Our Father wants us to dream his vision. Our Father has a vision. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So our Father has a vision in heaven. And his vision is his son, Jesus Christ. So we dream our Father's vision to promote his son. Jesus says in John 15, Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. And this is my Father being glorified, he says, that I be lifted up. So I am glad about this coming event next Sunday because it's part of the commission, Jesus says. So we're on the right target. We're on the right perspective right here. So Jesus came to the world. They miss it. As it is today, many are going to miss it. But the Bible speaks of one Messiah. The Bible speaks about only one Messiah and two different comings. The son of, the son of Joseph, the son of David. In Hebrew, Ben Joseph, Ben David. Suffering servant, conqueror servant. He came as a suffering servant 2,000 years ago to fulfill Isaiah 53, the Lamb of God. And one day he coming back as a conqueror servant to fulfill Zechariah 9:10 from Jerusalem and different prophecies from Jerusalem to give the Messianic kingdom to the world. Uh, also, he spoke in Acts 1, 6 through 8. It is right there. Therefore, in the meantime, we must be focused. We know next event's coming up, but stay focused. Don't push the agenda of what we are under right now. We are under the order of Pentecost. That's why John 16 said once again, I said it before, do it again. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, 
Whosoever means an invitation to everybody. Whosoever believes in him, whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but has everlasting life. It's a open invitation to everybody. Friends, it's open to the whole world. But you know what breaks my heart? If you read carefully Revelation chapter 20, John the Apostle, in the Isle of Patmos, God gave a vision. He penned down that even in the future, many will go to the judgment seat. Many will go to the lake of fire. Although it's an open invitation for God's love of the world, whosoever believes in him, many whosoever will reject him, ended up in the opposite way of heaven. It is going to happen. It is written. It's going to happen already. Thanks God we belong to the first resurrection. We thanks God for the mercy of God to open our heart to see his son. So today, you know in your heart, Jesus Christ. Do you know him in your heart? Is the question. Do you know him in your heart? So we belong by the grace of God to the first resurrection. Thanks God for the mercy of God. That is why we must, as a believer, have that responsibility to stay focused on the gospel of Jesus, the Son of God. This is it. This is the priority of the Father through us that His Son be lifted up in the world. What a privilege. We are born in the century. On the stage we are to shine His Son to the world. And that's what Paul concludes in Romans 1.17. Paul says in Romans 1.17, he says, For in it, meaning the gospel, the righteousness of God is found. In other words, friends, outside the gospel, there's no righteousness. Outside the gospel, you, gospel, you find only tradition, religion, customs, external things, anything except righteousness. And what does it mean, Romans 1.16? In the gospel, you find the righteousness of God. This righteousness of God is only the person and the work of the person. The person is Jesus, God the Son, and the work that he died, rose from the grave. But this person, who is this person? And this is the most controversial point of the whole world. People always struggle about Jesus. It's amazing. It is easy for a Jew to say, I'm a Buddha, Jubu, <laughs> Buddhist, Jubu. <laughs> because I'd rather be a Jubu, a Jew believing in Buddhas, than a Messianic Jewish believing in Jesus. You know, the last month, in, we prepared a Jewish campaign in Nepal. <clears throat> I was uh, doing some work. My wife said, Henry, make phone calls in America. You know, this, so Nepal is very poor. We bless the people, everything. So I went to the lobby, to the hotel. I got a Skype calling Florida. It's from the Skype. <laughs> from, you know, by interruption. And here comes all the Nepalese people, you know, working in the lobby. They are like me, that color. So I they think I'm Nepalese. <laughs> so what happened is they were the police working, and here comes an entourage of white people, tall, Germans, Americans, British, like Tim Newman, that tall, you know? <clears throat> and they're speaking English, you know, all this stuff. And among all those six, eight people, there was one guy in the middle with a white rope, white shirt, white pants, with a haircut style, giving counseling. He had told the people, he said, yeah, you know what? Uh, yeah, it's good to let it go. We have to empty our minds and go with the flow. You're on the right track. You know, Hinduism, all this stuff. He was a guru guy. And then the Holy Spirit got a hold of my heart. This guy is Israeli. And then I asked the guy that got from Germany, I said, where are you from? He said, I'm from Germany. And I said to him, what is this guy in England? This guy American, this guy blah, blah, blah. I asked him, what about the guy in white ropes? He's from Israel. I said, okay. So everybody walked away, you know. And I said, Shalom. So I went off in Hebrew. She so looked at me like this, you know, Hebrew in Nepal. How could it be? You know? So we sat down for 15 minutes. Shut the whole gospel that Jesus God is not Messiah. How come you know you boo Jubu? <laughs> he said, Hannah, Jubu, because I grew up in Israel and I got tired of Judaism. I just gave up Judaism in Tel Aviv. He's from Tel Aviv area. I just tired of religion, Tel Aviv, Judaism, I just give up. And I don't want this hypocrisy, this. I found my peace in Hinduism. I said, you know, you're right. Rabbinical Judaism push you away. But you never understood biblical Judaism. And the rabbi pushed away from the truth of biblical Judaism. He goes, what biblical Judaism means? What's the difference between biblical Judaism and rabbinical Judaism? I said, biblical Judaism means biblical Judaism means what the Bible says. Biblical Bible. Old Testament, rabbinic is what the rabbi says, and they change the whole code here. They blind you away from Jesus. If you get to the Bible, what the prophets say, Isaiah, Zechariah, I began quoting the whole Old Testament. He engaged five minutes extra 
eye to eye. He heard the whole gospel that Jesus got the son that loved him. He's this, this is the prophet speaking about the Messiah. He loved you. This is your Messiah. And the people came down, took him away from me. <laughs> he walked away thinking. And the Lord used that event, Pastor Tim, to confirm my heart. Stay focused. Train my people, the churches, the born again Gentiles in Nepal, to do with God's help the first Nepal Jewish campaign. Tons of Jews go to Himalayas, and we reach Jewish people in Asia, automatic was the rich Gentiles. And that's what happened here. Jesus. He goes, oh, Jesus the Messiah? He goes, I go, yes, you got it down. He is the Messiah. God the Son. So, John, here, here in Romans 1, 17, Paul says, for in the gospel you find the righteousness of God. So who is the person? John 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This Word was God. Is and will be the same verb. Is God and the Word will be forever God. John 1 14 says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. See, He's the Messiah, tabernacle with us. And we beheld His glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. That's why Jesus says, I am the truth, I am the way, I am the life to the Father. No one comes to the Father except through me. That being said, then John 1 18 seal up the whole thing. John 1, 18, Jesus says, the Bible says, the Lord Jesus says to John, no one, meaning I have a high Hebrew, no one has seen God, meaning the Father. Have you seen God before, the Father? Have you seen the Father before? No one. No one. The Bible says, Jesus says, no one has seen the Father. At any time, only God the Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, He has revealed Him. What a beauty. What eternity. Eternity has been given to us through Jesus the Messiah. Through him, he says, if you know me, you know my father. If you know me, you know who the father is. Through me, you know who the father is. I said this because these days around the world, you find somebody who says, I went to heaven. I saw the father God. I come back to earth and he write books and sell books to the churches. How could it be? But Jesus says, no one has seen the father. So either the person is right, Jesus is wrong, Oh, Jesus is right, and the person is wrong. <laughs> Jesus says, I am the way to the Father. And this is very exclusive. This is absolute. The people in the world don't want to hear today. People in the world today do not want to hear about absolutes because the moment they hear absolutes, the heart becomes accountable to this living God. Now the image of God and the person begin to respond, to act or react, just like Jesus days when he entered Jerusalem a donkey. People act. How they reacted. The same thing happens today. People act or they will react next weekend. But God says, For God still loves the world, that He speaks through His Son today. Hebrews chapter 1 says, In past time, God spoke through prophets, but in this last day, now, God speaks through His Son. Do you hear the voice of Jesus every day? Do you spend time with the Father every day? I'm sure you do. That's why we're here today to worship our Father. So I want to encourage you, really, to take this Passion Week to remember Him. Because he is the way, he is the truth, he is the life. And I'm excited to know that reality that keep me going around the world to bring this good news to Jews, Jews, or Gentiles around the world. So may the Lord bless you and keep you. I trust God you all know Jesus. He's the Lamb of God, entered Jerusalem as the King. He's coming back again to take us home to heaven in the next feast. Stay focused on the gospel of Jesus. Be mindful of the next feast, the rapture, but leave the feast of uh, Pentecost today. Obedient to the voice of the Master. Go preach the gospel. If there is one person here, as in my heart to pray this way now, I trust you all know Jesus Christ in your heart. But there is one person here, for some reason, you believe in Christ in the mind, but if in your heart, you are not sure you know him. I want to pray right now to give an invitation to surrender your heart to Jesus Christ in your heart. Let him become the cup of redemption in your life. Give the life to him. Lord, I give my life to you. You take away from me this cup of judgment. You take away from me this cup of judgment. The cup of judgment, now I'm car number two. I'm about to drink if I die. Today, all over the world, people are the two cups. I'm sorry, I got two cups here. <clears throat> two cups in the, in, the, in, the, in the communion table. Four cups. Car number two, car number three. Cup of judgment, cup of redemption. If you die tonight, under which cup will you die? If you die tonight, 
under which cup will you die? Under cup number two, the judgment, you drink your own judgment, or under cup of redemption, you have life eternal before the Father. Under which cup will you die tonight if you die tonight? And the cup of judgment or cup of redemption? All up to the mountain of mercy To the crimson perpetual time Kneel down on the shore Be thirsty no more Go under and be pure and fine Follow Christ to the Lord Sinners sorry and wrecked by the fall. Bless your heart and your soul in the fountain that flows for you and for me and for all. And the wonderful, tragic, mysterious dream on that beautiful, scandalous night. You will. 